Paul traveled by foot across Asia Minor, that is Turkey today, on his second missionary expedition. This time he chose a man named Silas to go with him. They encouraged the churches that Paul had founded on his first journey. But we're told that the Spirit of Jesus stopped Paul from speaking any more in that region. Then Paul saw a vision, a vision of a man standing on what we now call the continent of Europe, saying, come and help us. So immediately Paul sailed from Troas to Europe. And the first place that Paul stepped on European soil was the seacoast city of Neapolis. Landing on another continent had to be a profound moment for Paul as he anticipated engaging a whole new region of the empire. Just to the west, Paul and Silas entered the city of Philippi, a Roman colony. Philippi, like other Roman cities, was laid out with order, complete with a theater, stonework, paved streets, and as always, a marketplace, an agora. But in contrast to this model city, its citizens were spiritually homeless. After some days in Philippi, Paul and Silas went to a nearby stream to pray on the Sabbath. There they spoke with a businesswoman named Lydia. This area has traditionally been identified and memorialized as the place where Lydia became the first convert in Europe and where she was baptized. Close by, a church was built to remember Lydia's faith in Christ. Just inside the doors, I found a mosaic map of Paul's second missionary journey. He begins in Antioch here, in Antioch. This is Ephesus, up to Troas, Neapolis, Philippi, that's where we are now, then Thessalonica, Beria, Athena, it's the Acropolis at the top of Athens, Corinth. Then he sails back here to Ephesus. It's a great, great map. Murals retell key events in the life of Paul. Some foreshadow the troubles Paul would soon encounter back in Philippi. In keeping with the pattern of Paul's ministry, God allowed something bad to happen to Paul and Silas in order that their message would become very public. All right, so this is where we're at. We're on the second missionary journey. I just want to take you back to Paul's first missionary journey and then show you again what, what map was on that floor. It's so amazing that actually over there in this city, there's a place that you, you, you see on the floor his second missionary journey. But this is the first one. This is where Paul and Barnabas went, right? Antioch to Seleucia, down to Salamis, all the way up and around. And this is where he was stoned. Remember Lystra? He was stoned, left for dead, and then he went back into the city. I mean, you talk about courage. He went right back into the city where they stoned him. The next day, went to Derby. There was a lot of people coming to know Christ in Derby. He didn't stay there long. He went back to the places that needed him and, and needed to hear the word of God. So that's the first missionary journey we see last week where they ended up back in Antioch and they, they told of, of the missionary journey that they had. Then there was a disagreement about whether people should be circumcised, whether the Gentiles, now they could have Christ, they could have salvation. Gentiles, that means a lot to you and me because we're not Jewish. Now, salvation is offered to us. And that should make us go, wow, yes, thank you, Jesus. You know, because now Gentiles are receiving Christ. But they all had this thought, well, the males had to be circumcised to become Jewish and then become saved. But that was man's, man's way of getting to salvation. And that's not it at all. It's about what Jesus did. We're going to see that in a second. Let's go to the second missionary journey. This is the map that was on the floor. The second journey goes. So this was his first journey right in here. Look at where they go. They go double the way, almost over to Italy. This is the Greece area. This right here is modern day Turkey. 
um, over there. And, and, and this is all Greece right in here. So they, they wound up going so much further up here in Philippi, right up there. You see my shadow right there. Philippi, that's where we're going to land today and hear what happened. Um, but, but this is where they started off. They come through Lystra and, and go up uh, into Philippi. Now, again, we talk about salvation. All right, I want to make it really clear to everybody in here. Salvation is not by any works that we do. If you think baptism saves you, that's not, that's not what saves you. All right, salvation. Salvation is by grace, through faith, unto, or in Christ, through faith in Christ, right? Unto good works. We get that backwards. We think the good works is what saves us. No, 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 no. Keep this in the right order. This is what's said in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ to good works. Put the picture. The, the good work that was done, we can't do any good work that would compare to that right there. That was the good work. If we say we can do something to earn our salvation and get to God, we nullify this. We say, God, Jesus, what you did on the cross... No, 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 I got this. I'll earn my salvation. I'll work for my salvation. I'll get baptized so I can be saved. I'll do this, I'll do that. I'll, do, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my life clean and I'll do that good work to get to salvation. No. What that does is say, Jesus, what you did wasn't good enough. And that's not okay. What he did was good enough so that we can do by grace, through faith in what he did, then we have salvation. And then we do good works because... He did that. We want to please him. We want to do good works with our lives to please him and thank him for what he did. So that's the order. That's where we are today. Today, um, have you ever heard these three phrases or three words together? Um, we, we often hear this, um, I think, when there's like a fire. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but let me, uh, let me just throw the words out here and see which. Stop, look, and listen. Is that what we do? Or that's stop, that's stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> I was thinking, when, when there's a fire, stop, drop, and roll, right? You know, and, uh, and you know, but, but have you ever heard these three phrases or words put together, stop, look, and listen? Have you ever heard that before? Well, today, we're going we're gonna to keep coming back to this. Because when you boil it down, I think God wants us to do this. In encounters we have with people all around us. We need to stop, look, and listen. We're going to get there. The central idea for today is this. God will guide us as we follow his plan. Sometimes we don't know what's going to, well, we don't know what's going to happen an hour from now, a day from now, a week from now. Did, did a bunch of families in Texas know that their children were going to go to school this past week and not come home? No, they didn't know that. It was unexpected. We don't know what's going to happen the rest of the day, tomorrow, this week, this year. We don't know what's going to happen. In the unexpected, God will guide us as we follow his plan. It's so important because we're going to see God guide these, these encounters that Paul and Silas had today in Acts chapter 16. So you saw a little bit of the introduction in the video. I'm going to just follow it up with the scripture. In Acts chapter 1, that's where we're at. If you don't have your Bible, it'll be up on the screen. Here it is. Paul came to Derby, And when it says Paul there, it means Silas and actually some other groups of, of people that will come to find out. Paul came to Derby. All right, remember Derby was on that first missionary journey. Then he went on to Lystra. What was Lystra? Lystra is where he got stoned. So here on his second journey, he's going back to these places that harmed him. And it, he, he was just courageous. He didn't care. He was like, Lord, you know, do your thing. And, uh, and then a believer named Timothy, kind of biased to that guy right there. I, I kind of like that guy. A believer named Timothy lived there. His mother was Jewish. All right, watch this now. His mother was Jewish and a believer. His father was Greek. All right, so you had a kind of a mixture come together here for, for Timothy. The believers at Lystra and Iconium said good things about Timothy. That's my boy, Timothy. Go, yeah. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he circumcised Timothy because of the Jews who lived in that area. Now, did he need to be circumcised? No, he didn't need to. But Paul thought it would be good 
because it, he thought it might be a stumbling block to their message if he didn't. So he circumcised Timothy because of the Jews who lived in that area. They all knew that Timothy's father was Greek. So Paul and his companions traveled from town to town. They reported what the apostles and elders in Jerusalem had decided. Remember, they had that whole disagreement about circumcision. Well, they came up with a plan. They had it in letter form. And so Paul and, Bar and uh, Silas here were going to the, the elders in, in different towns and reporting what the Jerusalem council decided on, right? Now we pick back up. The people were supposed to obey what was in the report. So the churches were made strong in the faith, and the number of believers grew every day. Watch this, though. This is really interesting if you think deeply about this. Paul and his companions traveled all through the area of Phrygia and Galatia. Does that sound familiar, Galatia? There's a book called Galatians, and Paul wrote a letter to this church in Galatia, but he passed through this time, going through Galatia. The Holy Spirit had kept them from preaching the word in Asia Minor. Did you catch that? The Holy Spirit had kept them from preaching the word in Asia Minor. Does that sound weird to you? Why, why wouldn't the Holy Spirit want the good news in this place? Well, it's not that the Holy Spirit didn't want the good news in this place. He had a different mission for Paul. And so the Holy Spirit blocked him from preaching in Asia Minor. They came to the border of Mysia. Let's say Mysia. Mysia. From there, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not let them. So they passed by Mysia. Then they went down to Troas, and then during the night, Paul had a vision. He saw a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia, the man said, help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. We decided that God had called us to preach the good news there. Okay, all of a sudden in verse 10, you have we. Who is we? Who's writing this book? Luke. So not only is it Paul and Silas, but you've got some other people. you got Timothy now on the road with them. Luke is saying we all went. So now Luke's with them. So that's why it's saying Paul and his companions all traveled. So understand this. This is not just Paul and Silas, but a group of guys is going now. And so there they decided as soon as Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. Now Macedonia is like you and I going up to like northern Mexico, like way out there. And there was somebody way out there in a vision saying, come help us. And he's like, all right, let's go. We're going to go further now. And that's where I, I showed you at the top of that map, Philippi, they were at the far reaches, the far ends. This was the first time that Europe, the continent of Europe that we know today, had gotten the gospel from, from Paul and his, uh, his companions. So... This was kind of an interesting thing. God was saying no to certain places, but saying yes and giving a vision for God to direct him where to go. Now, I'm going to try and illustrate this to you in, in a way that you would understand. So I'm going to need uh, Zane. You, you kind of know from the kids' time that we just had uh, earlier what we're about to do here. Um, so let me see. I need... Some volunteers. All right, come on up real quick. Go ahead and spread these around. Spread these around, just kind of on the floor. Yeah, come and help. It's okay. Yep, need some people. Come spread some things around. Come on. Yep, spread them around. Okay, yep. Here, spread some around. Here you go. Yeah, toss them around, all around the, you know, the aisle on the board. All right, Zane, come on over here. Zane is going to be my volunteer, or voluntold. All right, now the object is, I'm gonna try and get Zane to the other side of the building, avoiding the cones, but I want him to try and step on to get points, the uh, bean bags, all right? So he's gonna to have to, and I can't touch him, I can only speak, all right? So Zane, go ahead and go forward one step, two steps, 
That's good. Right there. Stop. Uh, side step to your right. A little bit more. There you go. Forward. Go ahead. Forward. Keep walking freely. Walk freely. And stop there. Put your le uh, left leg to the left a little bit. Yeah, one point for you. All right, keep going straight. Keep going straight. Keep going straight. All right, side step to your left a little bit. All right, you're pretty free and clear. Walk for about three steps, three or four. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, keep on. You're on a roll. Stop there. Left foot out a little bit. Yep, there's two points. Keep going. He's getting points, y'all. All right, go straight. Um, yeah, you got some cords to step over. There you go. You're good. All right, go to the left a little bit. Side step to your left. Side step to your left. All right, keep going forward, forward, three steps. All right, side step to your left, three. Yep, keep going, three, keep going, one, one more, one more, there, you, one more, there, all right, we got, is that three points now we got? All right, all right, so turn your hips to the left, uh, one more, all right, now walk straight, three steps, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, all right, another three. Man, he's doing good. You guys give it up for him. He's good. All right. Um, turn your hips to the left. All right. One more turn to the left. Um, yeah. All right. Walk forward three steps. I missed a point over there, didn't I? All right. You're good. Side step to the left. One more. All right. Walk forward. Yep. Got that point. All right. Now good. Side step to your right. And yeah, walk forward three. Two. Three. All right, reach out your right hand and lean, 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 and lean, 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 lean. Yeah, he got it. All right, give him a hand, give him a hand, give him a hand. All right. So he did it. Okay, so what was so important in that challenge? Tell me, give me something, huh? Oh man, everybody's saying what? Yeah, listening, obedience. Following instructions, testing, huh? Yeah, a guide, trusting, yeah, yeah, very good, very good. And I noticed when I said, give you guys a hand, or give him a hand, that I was like, uh-oh, that's noise, that's noise, can he still hear me? You know, because guess what? The world is going to want to put out noise and, and, and get in between you and your relationship with the Lord so that you're not hearing him, you're hearing the the voice of the world, right? The enemy, right? The enemy wants to throw in, hey, yeah, just step to your left a little bit. Ha, 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 ha. Right? That's the enemy's voice. So you got to be listening for the true voice. And the true voice always, always is in line with Scripture. The true voice of God always, never goes against His Word. Never does. And so it's so important. But yeah, stop, look, and listen. And when you can't see, trust. Trust, right? When you can't see it. Um, and so, so here's, here's a couple of points. You know, when, when they were not able to go into Asia Minor or some of these cities, they're probably going, why? Why wouldn't God want us to go there? See, he had, he had a plan. No, number one point, God sets us up if we would just look for some these unexpected appointments. Every day, we might have some unexpected appointments, and we had no idea it was coming, but God set it up. God set it up. You encountered somebody, and and you didn't. You just kind of went on with your business. And maybe how many of you, how many of us this past week maybe missed some unexpected appointments? Maybe had a chance to say something about Christ, and we missed it had a chance to witness or, or, or ask them if we could pray for them or whatever. And we missed the opportunity because we're on our own agenda. We're on our own thing. We're not stopping. We're not looking. We're not listening. Here's, here's something. We're not looking. See, I put on my spiritual lenses. And see, we don't stop enough. We're just busy, busy, busy doing our own thing. Our agenda's got to get done. We got to get this done. We got to accomplish this. But we don't stop. And maybe put on our spiritual lenses and start going, whoa, this person needs prayer. This person needs something. Right? 
and we look. Thank you. And we look around and we actually look with spiritual eyes. Remember, Jesus came and he was so much more interested in people's spiritual condition than their physical condition. Like he would heal them, but he would understand, I've come to save the people from their sin. That's a spiritual thing. But a lot of times we don't stop and look and listen. And so, so we're, we're kind of in our own world. But God sets us up if we would just look for these unexpected appointments. And God, next point, God will sometimes say no to good things. It's a good thing for these people in Asia Minor to hear about Christ. But God stopped them. Why? Because God has a plan. Maybe they're not ready to hear it yet. And Paul had another mission. Maybe God was already using somebody else to reach those people. But when we force our way into what we think is good, sometimes it's not what God wanted because he had a whole other plan. Remember that verse of scripture that says, his ways are higher than our ways. We can't always see it. But we got to trust, just like the blindfold, right? The blindfold, we're going along. We got to trust. Step to the left. Okay, we'll trust you, Lord. I'm not sure that's so good, but we'll trust it. And we keep going on God's voice. So, stop, look, and listen. Let's move on. Verse 11. Here's the first encounter that we're going to see. We're going to see three encounters today, all right, that Paul and Silas and his companions have. The first you saw in this video, it was about a woman named Lydia. Verse 11. At Troas, we got into a boat. We sailed straight for Samothrace. The next day, we went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi. All right, here's where we land in Philippi. This was a Roman colony. We're going we're gonna to come back to that in a, in a while. Just remember that. It was a Roman colony. It is an important city in, the, in that, that part of Macedonia. Now, where was the man from that he was saying, hey, come help us? Macedonia. So they've reached it. All right. On the Sabbath day, um, or he said, we, say, we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate. Why did they go outside the city gate? Probably because there was no synagogue in the city. They're looking for somewhere that they can worship. And so they, they had to go outside the city gate. And we walked down to the river. There we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered together. Guess what? There probably weren't any men there who believed in Jesus. But there were some women. And so guess where they went? They went to where the people believed. And here they were, down by a river, and, and there they expected to pray. We sat down and began to speak to the women who gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia. She was from the city of Thyatira. Her business was selling purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to accept Paul's message. She and her family were baptized. Now, she was a worshiper of God. Was she complete? She wasn't complete just being a worshiper of God. She needed a message. And the message was, came from Paul about Christ and salvation. So she was undone. She was incomplete just being a worshiper of God. Guess what? We got a whole lot of worshipers of God out there but aren't saved. Guess what? I mean, I'm, I'm just being real. Here was a worshiper of God but still needed something. She still needed salvation. Paul was there to deliver the message of Jesus. So, here, here she is, a worshiper of God. She opened, the Lord opened her heart to accept Paul's message. She and her family were baptized. Then she invited us to her home. She said, do you consider me a believer in the Lord? She asked. If you do, come and stay at my house. She succeeded in getting us to go home with her. So guess what? They had a place to stay. They were missionaries. They didn't like they may not have had money just to get a hotel room. Um, uh, they needed a place to stay and here God provided a place to stay. So, <laughs> I love it because Paul, they stopped. They looked. They listened. They put on the spiritual glasses and they saw these women and they needed to tell them about Jesus. Look, look at this point right here. We expected dot, 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 but got dot, dot, dot. We expect. What did they expect to do? What did Paul and Silas and the group expect to do? 
They expected to go down the river and pray. But what did they get? A chance to share the scripture through a divine appointment. They got a chance to share about Jesus Christ. Guess what? We expect to the store, but maybe we get a divine appointment. Maybe we get a divine opportunity to share with somebody. Maybe we get an opportunity to pray with somebody that, that may be hurting. Who knows? But you might expect some things, but you get something different that God had set up. But you can't do that if you don't have these on. If you don't have these on, you're just going through life. You're going through the motions of, of routine. Let God do the unexpected. Watch out for it. You got to look for it. You got to see it. Now, the next thing is an unexpected appointments can lead to amazing moments. If you're not looking for it, you won't be ready for it. Unexpected appointments can lead to amazing moments. Little did Paul know that he was going down to the river just to pray and a woman's eternity would change. Now, did it say anything about the other women? No, it just said something about Lydia. Maybe Lydia was the only woman there that trusted what Paul and the companions had to say. But there was one. And her whole family believed. They expected to go to pray, but God gave them a, a divine appointment and changed the eternity of an entire family. Wow. That can lead to some amazing moments. Now, let's go on. There was a fortune teller. All right. Do, do they have those here in, in Belize? Some, some people like that deal in witchcraft. They, they call them fortune tellers. They tell the future, right? Do you, is that familiar here? Do they, they don't have those here? No, yeah. It's a different name? Okay, a different name. What, do, what is the name of that? I don't, I don't know the name, but you know who I'm talking about, right? The people you go, you pay them, and they, they try and tell you your future. Yeah. Read hand, yeah, so the palm readers, yeah, they read your hands and stuff. The first question I would, if I encountered one of them, I would want to ask them, hey, did you know I was coming? Because if they didn't know I was coming, they're no good to tell me my future, <laughs> right? Because they didn't even know I was coming, all right? So, but here's the thing. It's, it's kind of like this. A Christian that goes to a fortune teller is like using one of these in the daytime. What good is it? What, what good is this light? It's on. Is this helping me at all? No. Why would I do a lesser fortune teller? Why would I go there for that? When I've got the sun shining my way around. It's the same thing spiritually. Why would I go to a fortune teller when I've got... The Lord who made me and all of creation knows who I am, knows me by name. Why would I go to them? Does that make sense? I, I mean, I hope that, I mean, I hope that makes sense because I, I don't understand that. But what they do is they make money by trying to tell you the future. And here, Paul encounters one that, that we're going to read about. Look at this. One day, verse 16, one day we were going to the place of prayer. There they were going to pray again. All right, what happens? Unexpected appointments. On the way, we were met by a female slave. She had a spirit that helped her to tell ahead of time what was going to happen. So guys, you gotta understand, this stuff is real, but it's demon possession. And the demon inside is giving her these things to tell people and then to make money for her owners. That's what's going on. She earned a lot of money for her owners by telling fortunes. The woman followed Paul and the rest of us around. Watch what she did. She shouted, these men serve the most high God. They are telling you how to be saved. And she kept this up for many days. How would you like to have somebody following you around everywhere you go? Ah, these men are telling people about the Most High God. They're going to tell you how to be saved. And you kept doing that for days. How would you like that? 
don't think I'd like that very much. It's almost like a mocking uh, voice, and it's a constant, oh, here we go again. And then verse 18, she kept us up for many days. Finally, <laughs> Paul broke. You ever been there? <laughs> you ever been there? Paul's like, finally, we got to do something about this. He became upset. Turning around, he spoke to the Spirit and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, he said, I command you to come out of her. At that very moment, the Spirit left her. Guys, this is real stuff. I'm telling you, it's real stuff. This happened in Nicaragua. I didn't see it with my own eyes. But there was a girl, um, and, and, and she was translating language into mosquito language. Everybody, anybody ever heard of mosquito language? I know, it's like, zzz. no, it's not that language. It's actually a language that these people, they're called the, the mosquito type of, of people, they're on the um, northern and eastern side of Nicaragua. And you talk about just, I mean, everything is from the river. Okay, bathing, the water, everything is from the river. It's very, very, uh, you know, years and years and years ago kind of living, okay? She was trying to translate the Bible into the mosquito language. You would have to take a boat about 12 hours up to this little village called Cream Cream. Well, evidently what was happening in Cream Cream was something called crazy sickness. And what was happening is it was getting into young girls, like, like um, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 year old girls. And, and what was happening is it was demon possession. But they didn't know what it was. And so they called it crazy sickness. But they would take grown men to hold these girls down, or they would run off into the woods and never be seen again, or they would run off and jump into the, off the cliff into the river and they would drown. So grown men were having to hold this. This is called, this is demonic possession. And so Aaron, this girl who was translating mosquito language, she went up the river. She started living among these people. And she, one of her good friends that she had known, it was a young girl, she had come down with this crazy sickness. At this point, though, she was just sleeping. And she wasn't waking up. Um, and, and, and so she was still breathing. But Aaron went to the house, knocked on the door. The mother answered the door. She said, hey, can I come in and pray? And she said, yeah, come back and I'll show you where she is. So she's laying there, this little girl. Aaron gets down on her knees beside her. And she didn't really know much about demon possession. She just knew what the scripture said. Like people would come up against a demon and say, in the power of Jesus' name, command you to come out of her. So she's like, okay, I'm praying here. So out loud, she says over this girl, she says, in the power of Jesus' name, I command you to come out of the girl. And the girl goes. And she goes, in the power of Jesus' name, I command you to come out of this girl. And the girl goes again. Third time, Aaron says out loud, in the power of Jesus' name, I command you to come out of this girl. And the girl goes and woke up. Came to. The spirit of that demon had left her in the power of Jesus' name. Guys, this is real. This is what happened. There was this girl following Paul and his companions Paul finally had enough, turns around, says, in the power of Jesus' name, command you to come out of this girl. Spirit left. Well, guess what happened? The money that they made also went with that spirit. So now this girl is pretty much useless to these owners. Well, what do the owners do? They get hot. They get mad. What do you say? Vexed. <laughs> right? Vexed. They get upset. They get upset because now all their money just went out the door. It's gone. Oh, by the way, Aaron, she was saying all that out loud in English. The only language this girl spoke, mosquito. <laughs> mosquito language is all this girl knew to speak. So it wasn't the girl going, uh-uh. It was a demon. It's real. What I'm trying to tell you is this was a divine appointment. This was a divine encounter that Paul had with this girl. And this girl must have been thankful to be freed from this spirit. But the owners were mad. Let's pick up the story. The female, verse 19, 
The female slave's owners realized that their hope of making money was gone. So they grabbed Paul and Silas, they dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities, they brought them to the judges. These men are Jews, her owners said. They are making trouble in our city. They're suggesting practices that are against Roman law. These are practices we can't accept or take part in. The crowd joined the attack against Paul and Silas. You have this mob mentality, right? Oh, all right, let's, let's just go. Everybody get against Paul and Silas now. The judges ordered that Paul and Silas be stripped and beaten. In some versions, said beaten with rods. And they were whipped without mercy. Then they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received his orders, he put Paul and Silas deep inside the prison. He fastened their feet so they couldn't get away. Let's stop, look, and listen. Let's stop, look, and listen. Stop here. Look at what's happening around you. This girl, she needed freedom from a, a demon. And Paul and, si and, and, and the companions, they were there and freed this girl from this demonic possession. But then, Paul and Silas... <laughs> What, did, what, what were they expecting? They were expecting to just go and pray. And this girl winds up shaking everything up. And they free this girl, but then they get in trouble. So here's another thing. We expected, but got this. What is the, what is the point in this one? We expected to go pray, but then we got thrown in prison. Man, all they were doing was going to go down and pray. But they got thrown in prison. Listen to this. Unexpected appointments can lead to painful moments. Man, they didn't expect that that day. To get beaten with rods and they get thrown into prison. Just because they were on their way to go pray. And then they had to deal with this. So they're in there praying. So what would you be doing? What would you be doing? Here it is. The jailer. All right. Here's the the third encounter, about midnight. This is what uh, everybody, all the kids, we got to do this story in, in here. So that's, that's what led up to this, kids, is, is all this. Now, we're in the jail. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. They were also singing hymns to God. Would you be singing hymns to God and praying if you had just been beaten with rods and thrown into jail? I don't know. I don't know. I hope I would. I hope I'd be singing my heart out. The other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a powerful earthquake. It shook the prison from top to bottom. All at once, the prison doors flew open. Everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. He saw that the prison doors were open. He pulled out his sword and was going to kill himself. He thought the prisoners had escaped. And Paul shouts out, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer called out for some lights and he rushed in, shaking with fear, and he fell down in front of Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out. He asked, listen to this question, the jailer asks, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? God put Paul and Silas in jail, creates an earthquake, and this jailer comes rushing in thinking, I mean, he, he thinks he's going to be killed because he didn't do his job. But he realizes, I have hope. The prisoners haven't run off. And so there, there's hope. And his first question to them is, what do, I, what do I need to do to be saved? Paul and Silas are thinking, another divine appointment. Another unexpected appointment. God has set up for us right here in front of us. He's asking us, how to be saved. Now, if a jailer came to you and said, what must I do to be saved? Can you tell them? Can you tell them? Can you tell somebody what they need to do to be saved? The Bible says we all, that our believers need to, to be able to know and share the reason for the hope we have. Look at what Paul says. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, then you and everyone living in your house will be saved. So they spoke the word of the Lord to him. They also spoke to others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took Paul and Silas. Look at this. 
washed their wounds. Right away, he and his whole family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his own house. He set a meal in front of them, and his whole family were filled with joy. They had become believers in God. Paul and Silas, this jailer rushing in, he's the enemy. He's the one keeping them in prison. But not if Paul and Silas had these on. And it actually asked them, what must I do to be saved? And they look at him as a divine appointment. And they start telling him, and guess what? The whole family, just like Lydia, they become saved. And he brings them out of the prison, washes them up, gives them a meal. These are prisoners. He gives them a meal. And there they believe. <laughs> what did Paul and Silas expect? We expected this, but got this. Paul and Silas are probably sitting there in prison going, man, we got another night of this? Are we going to be put on trial? What's going to be happening to us? They probably had all sorts of expectations. But what did they get? They got an earthquake, and they got somebody to witness to, and they accepted Christ. The whole family did. Man, unexpected appointments can lead to meeting people in their painful moments. Here was Paul and Silas at a painful moment. But an unexpected appointment is what God had in mind this whole time. Could this man have been the one in the vision saying, Paul, come and help us here in Macedonia? Could that, this jailer have been that man in the vision? I don't know. God knew they needed help, though. Three encounters, unexpected appointments. The beautiful thing is, we all have unexpected appointments. And we might have some today, tomorrow, the next day. We don't know. So here's the rest of this story to finish out. So early in the morning, the judges sent their officers to the jailer. They ordered him, let those men go. The jailer told Paul, and the, ju the judges have ordered me to set you and Silas free. You can leave now. Go in peace. <laughs> What's Paul do? Paul replied to the officers, They beat us in public, he said. We weren't given a trial, and we are Roman citizens. What? what now, what did we say about Philippi? It was a Roman colony, wasn't it? And Paul drops out that he's a Roman citizen. If you got beaten and thrown in jail without a trial and you were a Roman, oh, that's bad. That's really bad. And Paul brings it out. They threw us into prison. And now, they do they just want to get rid of us quietly? He said, no. Uh-uh. Let them come themselves and personally lead us out. The officers reported this to the judges. And when the judges heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they got afraid. They were like, oh no, we just beat Romans without a trial. What are we going to do? So they came and they said they were sorry. Some versions said they pleaded with Paul and Silas. And they led them out of the prison and they asked them to leave the city. So after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house. There, remember Lydia, right? They went back to Lydia's house. There they met with the believers. And here's what their words were to them. Be brave. Be brave. We just got beaten, thrown in jail, because we know Jesus. He said, be brave. And then they left. They left. There's a book in the Bible called Philippians. That's this place. That's these believers. The church that was started in Philippi, Paul wrote the book of Philippians to these people. If you've never read the book of Philippians, it's four chapters. Read it this week. Read what Paul's heart was to the Philippian people. And then read it with this in mind. As you're reading Philippians, 
realize Paul was in jail in another city about about close to death. And he writes to the Philippian people and the book is all about joy. Have joy in whatever circumstance that you're in. Go read the book of Philippians. It's amazing. All right. Um, That's the end of Acts chapter 16. So our central idea is God will guide us as we follow his plan. They had three unexpected appointments that day or, or, or in this time. And man, God used each and every one of them. So the challenge to us first is, I mean, we need to stop, look, listen, but we need to add something in there. Stop, look, listen, and obey. And obey. A lot of us have the want to, but not the follow through. Haven't we said that before? A lot of us have the want to, but we don't have the follow through. And so it's stop, look, and listen, but then obey. See, Zane could have sat here and stop, look, listen. He could have listened and listened and listened, but not actually take a step. Obey and see where God will take you and be ready for the divine appointment that God might have for you to be able to pray with somebody, meet someone. You might meet them in their darkest moments. And God set it up. So take the opportunity. Hey, how can I be praying for you? Are you doing okay? Put these on. Look past the physical person. Look into them and say, hey, what's going on in here? Are you okay? And they might just open up to you and share what's really going on. And then you can be there for that divine appointment that God set up. But will you stop looking and listen and obey? The challenge to us then is, will you choose to follow Jesus even though you don't know everything he will ask you to do for him? Sometimes along along life's journeys, there's gonna be obstacles to avoid and God will get you around them. Temptations you don't need to go to, but there's gonna be blessings he wants you to jump into. And then, but you gotta stop, look, listen, and obey. The believers have been through a lot. So this is my favorite part. Let's go ahead and um, circle up, and we're gonna just get in groups of five or six, and we're gonna do just uh, a few questions um, to kind of bring this home and bring this challenge home to us, okay? So go ahead and group up a little bit. Question number one. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to follow God's plan? Okay, so what are some of your thoughts? Why is it so hard to obey God's plan? Any, anything you guys discuss you want to share? Huh? Doubts. Doubts. It's hard to trust God. You're doubting, yeah. It might be painful along the way. Yeah, what else? Other thoughts? Temptations. Yeah, they distract us from following God's plan. What else? Yeah. Yeah, afraid of other people's thoughts about you. Yeah, what else? Any others? Why is it so hard to follow God's plan? Yeah, we don't always know. It's not clear. And then that leads to doubt. Like, I can plan it. I got this out, God. I got it. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll pray and consult him sometimes, right? Instead of really listening and obeying. Yeah. Yeah, I never know what's on the way. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Good. Good deal. All right. So what does it mean to stop, look, listen, and obey? What's it mean? Like, how is that practical in our lives? What what would that look like? What's that look like to stop, look, listen, and obey? Any ideas? What does that look like? Stop, look, listen. Yeah, not always being in a rush. Like, what if Zane had just started? I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. Hold on, stop. Stop a second. Right? And, And you know what that takes? Jesus said, in order to be his disciple, what what did we have to do first? Deny ourselves, 
take up our cross, follow him, right? The first thing is to deny ourselves. When we're always in a rush, you know, we don't want to stop because we're in control. We have the agenda. We have, sometimes it's God saying stop. I think sometimes with COVID, it really got people to stop. You had to stop, right? And start to listen. And, and then, yeah, what else does it look like? Stop, look, listen. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So sometimes God stops us and it's not the way we might want it to look like, but he'll get our attention sometimes. Say, "Look, let me have your attention so I can get through to you." Yeah, sometimes it, that that is what happens. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Sometimes we can think we can do it by ourselves. We got this. Yeah. What else? Stop, look, listen, and obey. What does that look like? Good answers. Good answers. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we need to follow his will, his word, his guidance. We got to listen to that and follow it, right? Yeah, very good. What any others? Yes. That's right. He's with you, right? He's not, not going to leave us or forsake us. So obedience is stepping out. What do you think Peter felt when he stepped out of the boat and actually felt something hard? I'm like, wow, I stepped out in obedience and here I am walking on water. But then it was the circumstances around him made him sink. He took his eyes off Jesus, starts to sink, right? And so, yeah, that, that obedience, it, it, it takes faith. Yeah. Any others? Any others? Good thoughts, good thoughts. Any others on that one? All right, let's go to, what are some examples? All right, we talked about this with Paul and Silas. They expected something, but they got something different. Maybe it's something that, that happened to you. You expected something, and then you saw a, a God movement. Like, you, you, you saw this divine thing that happened, but you were expecting something so much different. Go ahead and just share around there, or, or give some examples of what that could look like if it hasn't happened to you, okay? Okay, so what are some examples what are some examples, maybe real life story or maybe not? What are some examples of, we expected this, but got this instead? Any ideas? Any examples? Anybody have any examples on this one? We expected this, but got this. Any others? Anybody else want to? All right. Man. All right, well, here's the thing. We got to be ready for the unexpected. Because sometimes we expect something, and God's got his way, and we got to be willing to say, all right, this is the way God wants us to go. Um, I, I'm just going to tell you real quick my personal experience. Miss Jen and I, we expected to have children. But for eight years, we didn't have children. And so we wondered, God, what do you have in store? But we got three children from China. We got Braden. God wrote the story even though we had things the way we expected it to be in our mind, God had a different plan. And so those are things that we just have to be willing to say, hey, whatever you want, Lord, you do it. You do it. Um, and so any others? I don't, I don't want to leave any, any other. Yeah.
That's right. Awesome. Awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. He, he saw God move in a way that he wasn't expecting. Man, that's, that's the whole idea. God works in the unexpected to bring about, about his plans. Um, let's go on to Paul and Silas sang hymns in jail. How can we respond to suffering or painful times? How can, how can we respond to the hurt that sometimes we receive? They were hurt, and they sang, and they prayed. So what are some ways we can do that? What, how can we respond to suffering? How can we respond to suffering? What do you think? Yeah. By worshiping. Yes. Worshiping. That's good. What else? How can we respond to suffering? Help others. Yeah, help others. I think, I think of Paul and Silas when they were actually singing in there. The other prisoners were listening. Yeah. So it was, it was inspiring them as well. Yeah, it was inspiring them. What else? What else? How else can we respond to suffering? Say again. Think of Job. Yeah. I think about that. Like, if you don't know the story of Job, you can actually read scripture in response to suffering. You can read Psalms. You know, David. You know, he, he went through a lot. And he wrote about it in Psalms. What else? Any others? Yeah, serving others. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, what else? Any other responses to suffering? Pain. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Find people that will bring you up, right? Bring you up and toward Jesus. Absolutely. All right. Two more. This is it. What are some examples of meeting people in their painful moments. What could somebody be suffering with and you might meet them and you might need to share with them? What would somebody here, might, what, how might they be going through a hard time? Come up with a specific example. That's it, that's awesome, yeah. So Jose was just sharing with me uh, or with us about how he would just sit and listen to a person. A person came to him to talk to him and he had actually, um, I guess, run into somebody and, and killed the, 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 this friend. And, and um, the families became enemies. You know, and he felt bad. He felt bad. But when he would talk to Jose, you know, Jose would listen to him and just share with him. And so, yeah, you're going to have examples of, of hurting people that they've done something that they regret. And maybe it's caused families to go against each other. Yeah, that can be a very real situation. What else? What other examples there might be that people are hurting? Through COVID, yeah, COVID, the death, um, death of loved ones, um, um, e even people that are suffering right now and, and going through medical um, issues. Yeah. I mean, you might come up, uh, across somebody and you have no idea what's going on with them medically. But if you just reach out, say, hey, how can I pray for you? you might, they might say, wow, you have no idea, but I'm suffering with a cancer. You know, you, you never know what divine appointment you might have ready. Wow, all right, last one. This is probably the most important question. What can we do in the mornings to get our minds ready for the unexpected appointments that we might have that day. What can we, let's all answer this together, just be thinking, let's answer this one together. What, what can you do in the morning to get your mind ready for unexpected appointments? Prayer, very good, prayer. Yeah, read a Bible verse, read some scripture. Yeah. Pray, reading scripture. What else? Sing. Sing a song. 
Ask for guidance. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you those divine appointments today. That day. Give thanks. Practice joy. That's right. Reading devotions. Yeah, these are all ways. But, but what a lot of times we do in the morning. We get up. Boom. Get ready. Eat our food. Brush our teeth. Get dressed. We're gone. And we, we, we head into our day. And we haven't, we haven't gotten our minds prepared. We're not ready for those divine appointments. So we, it's important when we wake up, know that you could have... All right, last of this. All right, I'm going to ask the praise band to come, but wrap your mind around this because this is so important. You might be the one that changes, through Christ, changes somebody's eternal future. It's nothing that you do. It's what Christ sets up and by you sharing about the gospel, they might come to know Jesus and they might have... Eternity is changed because you were willing to step out and, and share with somebody about the good news of Jesus. When you wake up, are you getting your mind prepared for that moment in your day? That's a question we got to ask. It's, it's salvation by grace through faith in Christ and two good works. We're going to sing that in just a moment here. We're going to sing This is Amazing Grace. A lot of you guys know this song. We've sung it a lot here. We love it. Um, but it is. It's amazing grace. It's grace that changes our, our, our future. It gives us a hope um, and a future. So I'm going to ask Eli if he would pray. And then we're all going to stand and sing This is Amazing Grace, all right? So go ahead. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, uh, as we come, as we humbly come to you, Lord, um, we give you thanks um, for another opportunity, Lord, to be here as one big family. Uh, we give you thanks, Lord, um, for always loving us, um, for having mercy on us, Lord. Um, thank you for sending your son here on earth to die for us. Although we do not deserve it, Lord, uh, you're still the most loving and merciful God, Lord. Uh, Lord, I ask that uh, whatever we've, we have learned here, Lord, um, show us not to keep it to ourselves, Lord, but um, to spread it to the people in need, Lord. And um, Lord, I pray that uh, whatever we do this week, Lord, just keep us safe, keep us protected at all times, and, and keep us with good health, Lord. And um, also, Lord, uh, show us the um, to not be ashamed of you, Lord, and uh, give us the courage. Give us the courage to to spread your word, Lord. In your holy son's name, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Don't